The Maidan Revolution began at the end of 2013. By the time I arrived in early 2014, Maidan Square, the central square in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, was barricaded by ordinary citizens who had come out to protest against then-President Viktor Yanukovych, who had just signed a trade deal, excuse me, who had just rejected a trade deal with the European Union in favor of closer ties with Russia. I set up a portrait studio inside the barricades on Hroshevskoho Street. And there I stopped the men who manned the barricades and ran running street battles with the Berkut, the um, riot police, and asked to make their picture. Uh, this is Yevgen. He is a software developer from Lviv. And on your right is Maxim Ostiak. He's a musician. Both Yevgen and Maxim had recently been beaten by the Berkut and had had their hands broken, and they'd both been um, in jail for a few days. I photographed them when they uh, were released and returned to Maidan Square. And portrait photography is interesting in that it doesn't just show you what I, the photographer, see, but it also shows you how the sitter wants to be seen in some way. And so while I was uh, in Maidan for a, about a, a month, um, I made probably 500 portraits uh, during that time. I also mounted my smartphone over my Hasselblad camera. I'm, I'm making these pictures on um, a film camera, a medium format film camera that I hold at waist level. And I mounted my iPhone over the camera, um, looking through the viewfinder so that I could make videos that show you uh, exactly what it was I, that I was seeing while I was making these pictures. Okay. One more. Yeah. yeah, perfect. And last one. What's that? This one, the perfect. Excellent. Hang on. On the 20th of February, 2014, a day that became known as Bloody Thursday, Behind this wall of smoke, snipers had been positioned on rooftops around Maidan, and they started picking off protesters one by one. More than 50 people were killed in a matter of a few hours. This was the turning point in the revolution, and the next day, uh, Yanukovych fled Ukraine for Russia. I left my portrait studio in the same place, and I, f I stopped the people who passed my studio then and asked them to make their picture. Um, tens, maybe, maybe even tens of thousands um, of ordinary citizens came into the square after the revolution was won to pay their respects to the people who'd fought, fought these running street battles and also to the people who died and they often brought flowers that they first laid on the blood stains on the cobbled streets, and then the, over the barricades, and eventually covering the whole of the central square in a carpet of flowers. I thought that I was documenting the end of violent events in Ukraine. Of course, we now, that it was, now know that it was actually the beginning. Within one week, Russia invaded, occupied, and annexed the Crimean Peninsula. And six weeks later, a bloody separatist war backed by Russia began in the Donbass region of the east of the country. 
I write poems about the things that I can't photograph, including what it's like for me to witness violent events as a photographer. This poem is called Shooting, and it's about being in Maidan Square in 2014. <clears throat> shooting. What have you been shooting? An editor asks one afternoon in the south of France. Table service, Aperol spritz, sunglasses, and sunshine. We say we shoot people. Fire shutters, take pictures, capture subjects with cameras, and expose them onto film. Warfare's words ingrained in our lexicon. The Comanche married guns and horses on the Great Plains. Combining speed and firepower changed the battlefield forever. Cameras again. I wonder what shutter speed Kappa shot the falling soldier with. Perhaps 125th of a second? Fast enough to capture the moment of death for the first time. One afternoon, another year, under a sunless gray sky, Berahina looks out from her pedestal on the black square. Men stretcher the wounded down a hill, leaving a trail of bright red arterial blood across the cobblestones, fresh and thick. I follow, picking my way through smoldering debris and broken glass, my face covered with soot from burning tires a Maidan tan. Corpses lie under a barricade, each tucked in with a blanket, gray and waxy faces, blue lips, each with a single bullet hole to the forehead or chest, each ready for his close-up. I shoot them like everybody else. Under a hot shower at night, the water runs black over my feet. For the past eight years, the eastern Donbass region has been divided by a front line. And I've been reporting there since 2014, together with Elisa Sopova, who is a writer from Donetsk City herself. We've been looking at the ways that people continue to live, raise children, and adapt their lives in these fractured communities. We call the project 5K from the front line, because all of the pictures that I'm going to show you were made within 50 meters or five kilometers of frontline positions. This is Lena with her son in their summer kitchen in a small village called Opitna. Uh, Opitna has been disconnected from the electricity grid and main water um, and gas supply since the war started in 2014. Lena and her husband, who are in their 50s, are the youngest inhabitants of Opitna, and they stay to take care of the, their elderly neighbors. Alyssa and I make these pictures and are reporting in Donbass in two ways that somehow reflect uh, our own relationship as reporters. Um, Alyssa is the insider, we're documenting her community, and I am the outsider as the foreign journalist. Um, and while we hope that our pictures can help people feel something or imagine what life might be like if war was visited on our towns or our homes or our communities, um, people who've, who have never experienced war or haven't in several generations. And at the same time, it's our hope that the people in these pictures will recognize themselves in our pictures also. Over the years that we've been reporting in Donbass, um, Alyssa and I ran out of news hooks and the new angles that our editors always asked us for. And so 
In the absence of any better idea, we just kept going back and photographing the same people again and again. The picture on the right is in Opit, was made in Opitna, the village that Lena um, lives in. This is the first time that residents were able to visit um, the graveyard because it li lays in a, mine, um, in a heavily mined area, minefield. And this is the Grinick family, um, Olga and Nikolai, and their two kids, little Kirill and Miroslava. Kirill and Miroslava were both born after the war started, and they have never known peace. In fact, when we um, began visiting them in 2018, Kirill would fall asleep in his stroller every night outside the house, unperturbed by the sound of shelling in the distance. And this is Nikolai fishing with the two kids uh, in a lake nearby their home. Um, they started a tradition where they'd uh, have a barbecue that they invited their extended family to every time that Alyssa and I visited. And uh, Kirill playing with his mom's smartphone. Um, and Miroslava pulling him on a sled. These pictures were made in... 2020, during the pandemic and a, a lockdown in, in Donbass region. And this is Alyssa and I in Donbass. Um, this picture was taken on the first day that we met uh, in a monastery, which is why we're wearing these floral fabrics. And the picture on the right was made this summer. Alyssa looked so happy because she'd just seen a road sign that said, Donetsk, 53 kilometers, and um, she is not able to go home and visit her family, so she insisted we stop and make a picture. There was one time that Alyssa was able to take me to visit her family um, in Donetsk, and um, on one of our days off from reporting, she asked if she could show me her own neighborhood, um, which lies next to the airport um, and had been very heavily fought over in 2014-15. And on the way um, th through Kievska Avenue, we also passed her old newspaper offices, which had also been bombed um, and looted. And I wrote this poem for her uh, about this day. It's called Welcome to Donetsk. You teach me this wartime trick to look for, excuse me. You teach me this wartime trick to look for living pot plants in the windows on Kievska Avenue. Most are crisped and brown, but one green geranium and a succulent spider plant offer proof of life for the person who waters them. Whole apartment blocks are abandoned Collapsed telephone lines, blown up branches litter the road. No voices, no tinkering metalwork in the distance, no buses, no playing children. Leaves rustle, white noise. You say, it's like Sunday every day. Stray dogs and swallows and the soft thud of shelling. As you know, Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine at the beginning of this year, with sudden and very violent attacks across the whole of the country. These pictures were made in Bucha, a suburb of Kiev, which is now infamous because of the atrocities that were committed there by the Russians. This image on your left is of a, an exhumation of a mass grave which took place while residents watched and waited to see if their loved ones were buried inside. And in Kharkiv, where missile strikes hit the downtown area on an almost daily basis, often killing and injuring civilians and hitting civilian targets. And Trostianets, uh, 
a, a town that was occupied by Russian forces for a month. Um, and these images were made uh, one or two days after the area was retaken by the Ukrainians. More than ever, I have felt that photography is limited, for me at least, in its ability to really convey the trauma and fear and scale of violence and awesome, in its traditional sense, nature of the destruction that's taking place across the country right now. But when I came to write, I also found that I had few words. This poem is called, All I Have is a List of Things, and it was written in April, April this year. All I have is a list of things. Empty windows in Hostomel wave as I walk by. The bright fabrics of each living room billowing like handkerchiefs. Apartment facades smashed open, homes like dolls' houses. Kitchen, cabinets, bathroom, bath, bookcase full of books. Emergency workers dig for bodies in the debris. A man in uniform abseils down an open wall with a body tied into a rope. The dead man splits the body bag and falls three stories while his mother watches. Kids written on printer paper and taped to windshields. Along the highway, car after car stopped, shot out, every driver's door flung open. Abandoned Russian positions littered with half-filled bottles of piss. Plastic bottlenecks, all touched by the soft tips of soldiers' dicks while they kept watch at these windows. At night, somewhere in the city, outgoing. Gugum, gugum, gugum. Distant as thunder through the double glazing. 20 kilometers away, someone is suffering under this. I've kept photographing the same people for many years now. Yevgen in 2014, and on the right in Kiev at the beginning of the war. He volunteered on the second day of the Russian invasion um, and is now a soldier. And Maxim, he also volunteered immediately, as so many men who'd fought in Maidan did, as a drone operator. And he was killed in Kharkiv this summer. And the Grinicks, they fled their home, along with 14 million other Ukrainians. They're living in Poltava region now with relatives, and I asked Olya to tell us about the day she left. They'd been sheltering in the basement for three days, and she decided that she was going to go out for bread for the kids. As she was walking along the road, she saw a fast jet fly over really low, and she was so frightened that she started running. She said she almost couldn't see in front of her for more than a meter because she was so terrified until she came to a Ukrainian checkpoint where the soldiers asked her, have you seen a parachutist? She didn't know what they meant. And they told her, the pilot has ejected. If you come across him, just take a spade and beat him as hard as you can. She went back, got the kids, and left immediately. While Nikolai stayed to work in the factory in Avdivka, and eventually, when that was closed, joined the army. And Lena, she stayed in Opitna right up until mid-June. When I asked her why, she said, well, who's going to cut the toenails of my elderly neighbors if I leave? 
she was in the garden when a shell landed, and she took shrapnel in her right buttock, and in the center of her back, the piece of shrapnel just narrowly missing her spinal cord by a few millimeters. Donbass looks very different now. Currently, the largest artillery battle in Europe since World War II is taking place in the east and the south of the country. Russia occupies around 114,000 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory. And while there are no official death tolls, it's estimated that 200,000 people might have been killed this year. I report my poems in the same way that I do my journalism, and everything that I write about really happened. This is a poem that I reported this summer and wrote a few weeks ago. It's my first time reading it and it's called Sunflowers. Sunflowers. A policeman chews Semechke beside a checkpoint. One cupped handful, the other lifts shelled seeds to his lips. He splits kernels with front teeth and blows their husks to the dusty ground. Soldiers dig in across arable lands. Sunflowers, heavy with seed, bow black heads they can no longer turn to the sun. Six months now, and little movement on the front line. Summer slips by, rains come, and soon the icy winter will advance again. Take these semechke, a woman shouts at a Russian soldier. Fill your pockets so sunflowers will grow when you die here. Thank you very much. <laughs>